Good afternoon. Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about antivirals. As we heard last time, vaccines can prevent viral disease, but only if they're given ahead of time before an individual is infected. There is one exception that we discussed. Does anyone remember that? That would be rabies, of course, where we can vaccinate you after you have been bitten by a rabid animal because it takes a long time for the virus to reach the CNS and we have time to immunize you. But for most other cases, we cannot immunize you after the infection's begun. And in those cases, we use antivirals. Our antiviral defense of antivirals can stop an infection once it has started. We have been working on antiviral drugs for about 60 years. We don't have very many in the scheme of things. Only about 100 antiviral drugs are available on the U.S. market, most of them against HIV-1. As you can see in this graph here, 41 or so. And the increase in the number of HIV-1 drugs, of course, began in the 1980s, just after the virus was discovered. Most of these drugs are against persistent viruses or viruses that cause persistent infections like HIV-1, HCV, herpes viruses, because, well, you have a lot of time to diagnose the infection and prescribe an antiviral drug. For the acute viral infections, it's a little more difficult, as we'll see. So here we have a lot against HIV, herpes viruses, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C, and some against influenza. Why? Because it's an important virus that causes annual outbreaks and morbidity and mortality. And I presume at some point in the future, we'll add to this graph SARS-CoV-2. Here's an interesting series of pie charts showing you the drugs according to the virus and target. So here on the left, the virus that the drugs are directed against, of course, most against HIV-1, hep C, uh, herpes viruses, hepatitis B virus, influenza, and uh, a few others lumped in there. And the middle one, the middle pie chart's interesting. It is the virus and host target. So we have viral polymerase is the biggest target of antivirals, proteases, Integrase and hepatitis C protein, NS5A, a multifunctional viral protein. And then there are about 10 uh, host targets here. And finally, virus versus host target. So most antivirals are directed against virus targets. These are called direct acting antivirals. But you see 13 are directed against host targets. We'll talk about a few of those today. Why are we, do we have so few drugs? Why aren't there more? There are a number of reasons for that. And one is related to the fact that uh, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They engage host functions at every step in the reproduction cycle. Uh, and therefore, it's hard to find a drug that just affects the virus and not the host because we don't want to have side effects. And that limits the kinds of drugs we make because they have to be safe. So that's one reason. the virus intertwined with the host in terms of function makes it difficult to separate the two in terms of inhibiting with a drug. It can be done, but it limits you, and that's why there are so few. Another reason is that uh, a technical difficulty. Some viruses are difficult to propagate. For many years, no one could grow hep B or human papillomaviruses in culture. It still remains difficult, not routine to this day. Some viruses, there are no animal models. You need to have an animal model to test the efficacy before you go into humans. For some viruses, there are none, so you have to ask for an exception. And for smallpox, we have two licensed antivirals in the U.S. that have been stockpiled in case of a bioterrorist attack. And these were licensed without the use of an animal model for efficacy. And then finally, some viruses are extremely dangerous to work with, like Ebola virus and Lassa virus. Very few labs and the world can work with these viruses. So you have a limitation into uh, how many drugs can be screened. And a third reason for the so few antiviral drugs is that the compound that you make has to block replication completely. We say it must be potent. 
And this is in contrast to things that you take standard pharmaceuticals like aspirin or acetaminophen. In those cases, you don't have to fully block whatever the target is. They will work with partial blocking, but it's not the case. Partial inhibition for a virus is not acceptable because if, if you don't fully inhibit replication, you'll get resistance. And this graph uh, illustrates that. Here we have virus production on the y-axis with time. We give a drug in three different doses, and we're looking at the amount of virus produced. So there's an optimal dose where you inhibit virus production. That's what you want. An intermediate dose, which might be acceptable for another pharmaceutical, is no good. You're getting some virus replication, and that will lead to the evolution of resistance. And of course, a low dose is totally unacceptable. It won't have any impact on the disease. So we have to make potent antivirals, and this makes it expensive together with the other two limitations. Another problem, and this is why we see mostly antivirals for persistent virus infection, is that many acute infections are short, as we discussed when we talked about these infections. Short course of disease and virus production. In many cases, by the time you feel sick, it's often too late to give a drug and have an impact on clinical disease, as we'll see for some examples today. And so ideally, you would have to give these antivirals early in infection, and that's a problem because you have to be able to detect them. We'll get to that in a moment. Or you could give them prophylactically to populations at risk. But in general, we don't like to give drugs to healthy people. They all have side effects of some sort, and that's just not a good practice. There are some situations where it might be acceptable. One example is PrEP pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV AIDS in, in certain high-risk uh, populations. It's become acceptable to uh, use the drug to prevent infection. And of course, in the current outbreak of SARS-CoV-2, it would be nice to have an antiviral drug to treat, say, healthcare workers so they don't get infected. But in general, we don't, for example, in a flu season, give everyone antivirals against influenza. We don't have any broad spectrum antiviral agents. That would be another alternative to give you a broad spectrum, but we don't have them. We may have one, one someday, but not yet. Uh, and and the key here is we don't have rapid diagnostic reagents. So, you know, you have a rapidly developing acute infection, let's say a common cold. So you wake up, you have a sore throat, you go to your doctor. There's no diagnostic test to tell him or her what virus is causing your sore throat. And so there are no antiviral drugs. It's kind of a chicken egg issue. There are no drugs because there are no diagnostics, and there are no diagnostics because there are no drugs. If the two would get together, it might work. But right now, we don't have tests for every possible common cold virus, for example. Even the test for SARS-CoV-2 is not a rapid test. It's a PCR test that takes time. And so in the course of a, a short infection, that's difficult because if you don't have a test, you can't prescribe a drug. And if you had a test, it has to be done quickly. So these are logistical issues that need to be solved. I have this view that one day you will wake up, look in the mirror. The mirror will actually be a sensor that will look at your body, tissues, and fluids and say, you're virus-free today, have a nice day. Or we have detected an infection. The diagnosis is going to your physician's office. You can pick up the prescription later. I think that's the way it has to be to really make an impact. So let's talk a little bit about antivirals. First, a bit of history to put it in context. All the research and searching for antivirals began in the 1950s. Uh, this was really a result of the successes in treating bacterial infections with antibiotics shortly after World War I, of course. And in particular, chemists were looking at derivatives of the sulfonamide antibiotics to try and make antiviral drugs. They made thiosemicarbazones against pox viruses, which was still a major threat after World War II, but really no major effort until the 60s and 70s when the so-called blind screening programs were initiated to find antiviral drugs. And what is a blind screening program? This is where you have no attempt to focus on a, even a virus or a virus-specific mechanism. You may take a number of viruses and then ask, can I find something that inhibits them? Just their growth in cell culture, not even 
inhibiting a specific part of the reproduction cycle, as we'll see in a bit. So what would you do? You, you would take random chemicals. Many companies have huge collections of chemicals that they've synthesized for various purposes over the years. You can screen those, say, in an infectivity assay, natural product mixtures. You can get soil and just grow, ferment it, grow it up and, and see what's produced and see if there's anything in there uh, that can inhibit a virus. My wife we used to work for Merck. When we went on vacation, she'd bring Ziploc bags with her and collect dirt from all over the world. And she would write down the GPS coordinate in case it was a hit and they got something there, they could go back and get more dirt. So you can screen chemicals, you can screen natural products, you can go to a lake and get the water and grow it up, see what's produced and so forth. And then you find uh, which ones inhibit viruses in cell culture. You may get mixtures that block replication in cell culture. Then you purify it and try and identify what it is. Uh, and then if you can do that, then the chemists can modify the molecules further because what comes out of a, a chemical library or a natural product mixture is not going to be ready to be a drug. It has to be further modified to reduce toxicity, to make it more soluble, to make it bioavailable. That means if you take it orally, it gets into the blood. Not all drugs can do that. And the other pharmacokinetic properties uh, have to be improved, a whole, a whole host of them before you actually have a drug. And these kinds of blind screening assays, thousands and thousands and thousands of molecules were screened before anything ever reached humans. And there was a lot of effort, very little success. One notable example is a drug uh, called Symmetrel. So that's the trade name for the the drug called amantadine, which is a shortened name for the actual chemical name, which would run off the page here. It's so long. So the, the FDA makes up these uh, generic names, and then the companies that make them have a trade name that is catchy to make you remember it. And so Symmetrel or amantadine was approved in the 60s for the treatment of influenza A virus. It is, uh, actually, this is an old old line here. It's, there are more than three drugs available for influenza, but this one is no longer used because most viruses are resistant to it. We'll talk about the mechanism in a moment. But often when these drugs were identified, we didn't know how they worked. And this, vi this uh, antiviral, its mechanism wasn't figured out until the 1990s. Today, the way we discover drugs is very different. We can use common DNA technology and very sophisticated chemistry to target inhibitors for very specific parts of the virus reproduction cycle. We could take a viral gene, an essential gene, of course, you want to inhibit. We can clone the gene. We can put it in organisms, make the proteins. We can purify the protein. We can look at its atomic structure. We can design assays to look for inhibitors in very high throughput. So we can do thousands and thousands a day. And so we know the reproduction cycle of most viruses. So we can say we want to inhibit this particular cycle and even for viruses that won't grow in cell culture, you can take the gene encoding whatever protein you want to target, a polymerase, a protease, and we can make inhibitors. So we don't do blind screening anymore. We don't just throw mixtures into cell culture and ask for it to inhibit virus reproduction. We actually target a specific part of the reproduction cycle. And here's a, a schematic showing you examples of the, the inhibitors that we have, the antiviral drugs that are licensed that basically target every step in the reproduction cycle from attachment, penetration, and uncoating, mRNA synthesis, proteases that uh, process polyproteins, uh, enzymes that carry out DNA or RNA replication, even integration of retroviruses, all the way through to assembly uh, and release. We have inhibitors at each step. So these are examples of viruses for which we have inhibitors at each of these steps. And we'll go through today examples of each one to explain uh, how they work. But first, a few remarks on the path of drug discovery, what it entails. You know, people are saying now, why does it take two years to make a vaccine or a drug? Well, you have to find them, which takes time, and you have to make sure they're safe. Safety is an overriding concern. You cannot give people things that are not safe. And this is why anti-vaxxers who complained about the safety of vaccines have got it all wrong because they are tested extensively and that's why it takes a long time. So here's the path to drug discovery. You start with identifying a medical need. You have to have so many cases a year of a virus infection. There are many viruses that cause uh, 
handfuls of cases each year, and they're they're just not a, a medical need because there's no market for treating them. And then you do some research to identify a target, and you do a what we call a proof of principle. You show the target's essential because if you can take the gene for a target out, let's say you identify a protein in a virus, and you take its gene out and the virus replicates fine, then that's not a target for antiviral intervention. And then you do some more research uh, to figure out maybe the mechanism by which the, the protein works. Uh, and then you do your screening. You set up a screen, and this kind of research can help you establish a screen. Uh, and then you make s- uh, cell or mechanism-based screens. You can even do in silico stre- screens on a computer where you just have a computer go through all the possible molecules, way more than you could test in the laboratory. And again, if you're doing uh, wet screens, you can use natural products compound collections. You can buy collections from various sources now. Many universities have their own collections of small molecules. You can make your own. You can use RNAi, for example. And then your assay will give you some hits, which you then modify by chemistry to to make less toxic, to make more potent, uh, and eventually get a lead compound, which you will then uh, put into animals. Animals are an important part of this whole pathway. This is the preclinical part. You want to look at how the drug moves around in the animals, what tissues it goes to, how long it lasts, and so forth. Uh, you you want to make sure it is in the right place at the right concentration. If it persists long enough, if it's gone in 10 minutes, it's no good. You have to go back to the chemists, and they will know ways to modify it to make it last longer. And will it be safe? You have to dose the animals. Keep giving them more and more milligrams per kilogram until they have toxicity. You need to know how much you can give them, and then you use that information to plan a clinical trial later. And then if you have a, an efficacy model, this is great, because then you can say, does the antiviral prevent infection? And then after all of this, you can then move into humans, which of course is called clinical testing. There are a lot of hurdles in the way of finding a drug. A drug is what you bring to market. So what you discover in a screen is not a drug. It's a lead or a hit or a candidate. A drug is a licensed product. So you can start with hundreds of thousands of compounds in your screens and you throw some away because they don't have antiviral effect. You throw some away because of toxicity. Some of them work in cells, but they don't work in animals. They have no antiviral effect in animals. Some of them will have no toxicity in cells, but they'll then have toxicity in the animals. You throw those away. Many compounds will not pass a human toxicity test, although that's very rare because we do such extensive animal testing. That's usually not a problem. Of course, some of them don't don't work as antivirals in humans, so reject them. And then in the end, you may have a compound after 10 to 15 years at many, many hundreds of millions of dollars of cost, which you then apply to the FDA uh, to sell the drug. And now, of course, for SARS-CoV-2, we'd like to accelerate this process it can be accelerated to a year or two, especially if there are candidates already licensed for other viruses, you can test them to see if they work for yours. Let's talk a little bit about clinical trials. We didn't talk about this for vaccines, but it's the same process essentially for antiviral drugs and vaccines. We've talked about discovering antivirals, preclinical work, which means work in cell cultures and in animals to show you know, all the questions about it, whether it goes to the right place and so forth. And if it's it's toxicity. Every drug given enough will be toxic. How much can you give an animal in milligrams per kilogram? And then you're going to have to extrapolate to humans to figure out how much to dose humans. And then you apply to do a phase one. The FDA will look at all the data you've accumulated. And they, for an antiviral, they will say, well, is it not toxic in animals at levels that you want to treat people with, that you, sh- that you show are efficacious as- at preventing the infection? And they will decide whether they will let you do that in humans. And you do a phase one initially, which is a safety assessment, a small number of healthy subjects. You always use healthy people for this phase one. You don't want to give a drug in a phase one to sick people because you don't know if it's going to have side effects. So it's always healthy, and you sometimes can do dosing. You can give different doses based on what you see in animals. You say, okay, we found this toxicity. This is the maximum we can do in a mouse, and we can extrapolate that to humans. And if it's safe, then you can move into phase two, where you look at efficacy and safety continued. You can also look at dosing and its effect on efficacy. This means for an antiviral, you can do it in a couple of ways. You can give it to people who are sick already and see if it 
reverses their illness, or you give it to people and see if it prevents them from getting infected. It's a little harder to do for an antiviral because there's going to be a window where it will be effective. It's better, easier to do that uh, for a vaccine. And and the key here now is if if you're making a new drug against uh, an infection for which there are already drugs, you can't withhold the standard of care. You can't give people your drug instead of what exists. Very difficult. You have to give yours on top of it or do some other kind of study. And if it's effective against infection, then you can move into a larger phase three where you're still looking at efficacy in more subjects. You're looking at side effects still, but now you're saying, is this drug superior to what exists? Because if it is, then it can replace the standard of care. Anyway, this is very complicated. It takes a long time to recruit people, to plan the studies. Look at the timeline here. It's about six years to 12 years for completion of a phase three. Six years. So you can fast track this, but this doesn't happen in weeks. That's why you need one to two years minimum. And if if we have new antivirals against SARS-CoV-2 in 2021, it'll be a miracle, frankly. How do we screen for antivirals? Here are a couple of interesting assays that make it high throughput so you can do a lot of compounds very quickly and get past that and start modifying your hits. So here's a, an assay for a protease inhibitor. We have the substrate for the protease. These are, these are amino acids, A, B, C, D. There's the cleavage site between B and C. One end is attached to a bead, the other end to a, uh, a molecule that's gonna, that you can easily measure, fluorescence in this case. So the protease would cleave this and liberate the bead part from the soluble part. So you could centrifuge the product and take the supernatant and measure fluorescence as a measure of protease activity. And that's shown here. In this time versus fluorescence intensity, you can see uh, this is the protease working. And then you can add a drug and see if it inhibits it. So this could be done in a high throughput. Hundreds and hundreds, thousands of compounds can be tested a day when you automate it like this. That's a mechanism-based screen. You can also do a cell-based screen. We're using bacteria here. And here we have bacteria resistant to the antimicrobial tetracycline because they have this pump in the membrane of the bacterium that pumps out the tetracycline that you add so the colonies can grow in the presence of tet. You then engineer the protease site for HIV-1 here into the cytosolic part of one of these transmembrane sequences. So if you had the protease produced in the same E. coli, it would cleave this, this segment and it would make the bacteria sensitive to tetracycline. You would get no colonies if you plate them uh, on tetracycline when they're making HIV protease, because that little clip just inactivates the pump. And then you can add drugs and look for drugs that inhibit the protease. Protease inhibitor, they'll block the cleavage so you get colony. So you can use colony number as a readout for finding a drug that will inhibit the protease. And there are many, many other clever assays that you can detect uh, that you can design. In terms of the chemicals, we can now do thousands, ten th tens of thousands of compounds a day. It's all automated. The, the results are automatically read by uh, scanners. There's microfluidics involved. You can have the results sent up to databases and look at them remotely. Many companies, as I said, have chemical libraries. You can purchase them. You can purchase natural products, or you can still make natural products from soils or water or plants, etc. You can do combinatorial chemistry. You can have a whole set of different chemical linkers and fragments and join them together to make tens of thousands of different molecule combinations, and you can then test these small molecules in your assay. You can look at the structure of an enzyme active site and design on a computer molecules that you think will fit in and make those, test them, see how active they are, and then refine the model. Or you can say, let's put a million different variations of a compound through this active site, but let's do it computationally. And the computer will tell you, well, here's 100 that fit really well, and then you can take those and start making them. This is all robotized now. High throughput screening are, is done by robots. They involved plastic plates with different wells in them. This one has 1,536 wells. This, the reactions are added by a robot to each well. The robots pick up the plates and put them in incubators. They take them out. When they're done, put them on plate readers. It's all automated. You don't have to do any manual pipetting, so you can do a lot of assays in a single day. First question is, we have many antibiotics, but fewer 
antivirals. What is the reason for the difference? Robotic screening is slow. There are few serious viral infections. Resistance is a problem. Antivirals must be potent. All of the above. Most of you got D. Antivirals must be potent. Resistance is a problem, but that doesn't limit you from making antivirals. It limits their effectiveness, and then you have to make more. But the potency is the real issue. Let's talk about resistance, because you have to assume you're going to get resistance to any antiviral drug that you make. If you ever hear someone say, there's not going to be any resistance, they're wrong. Because we have viral mutants resistant to every of the antiviral drugs that we have now, all that hundred or so drugs, there's resistance to all of them. And that's because viruses replicate very efficiently, make lots and lots of copies, of course, lots of lots of uh, virus particles, and they have pretty substantial mutation frequency from modest to high, as you'll see. This is a big concern during lifelong therapy for a chronic infection like HIV and Hep B and Hep C and so forth. Although Hep C now is been limited. We can cure those infections uh, in weeks. Now, this is a problem because we don't have a lot of antivirals. So you know, if you have resistance, there's not often a lot to turn to. So if you have resistance to a drug, you have to obviously change the drug. And if there isn't another drug available, which is the case for some viruses, then you can't stop the infection. The patient may die. On the other hand, if you look at the mechanism of resistance, you can get insight into how it works and maybe design strategies to circumvent the problem in the first place. The mechanism, of course, involves genome mutation. And the RNA viruses are the masters of genome mutation. All polymerases, whether it's DNA or RNA, make mistakes. They make errors. Uh, most RNA viruses, the genome does not encode a correction mechanism. There's an asterisk here because there is one big exception, which I'll show you in a moment. RNA viruses in general make one mistake or one misincorporation per 10,000 to 100,000 nucleotides polymerized. So if you have a 10,000 base genome, every time it's copied, you get one mutation. When you make 10,000 copies, you have the whole thing substituted. And 10,000 copies is nothing in a virus-infected cell. That's a million times higher than the mutation rate of our host DNA, of our DNA. So one mutation in one to 10 genomes for an RNA virus. Now, the exception is the nidoviral genomes, which include encode a proofreading exonuclease. So I want to introduce uh, what is a nidovirus. Nido is Latin for nest, because all of these viruses make nested mRNAs. That means they overlap. So nidovirales is an order, the taxonomic level of an order which means it's a collection of families. So nidovirales includes the coronaviridae and some other families of coronaviridae-like viruses that we haven't talked about uh, that infect other animals. Uh, but these genomes are between 30 and 40,000 bases long. They're huge. They have to have a proofreading enzyme. Otherwise, they would be extincted mutationally. And so they have this protein called uh, NSP14 or exonuclease N, uh, which is actually has two parts. It has the exonuclease part and it has a methyltransferase part, which is involved in methylating cap structures of the mRNA. And at the bottom here is a model of the RNA being replicated, template primer. Here's the RNA dependent DNA, RNA polymerase of corona or nidoviruses in red NSP12, and then 14 is associated with it. So if, if the polymerase makes a mistake, uh, 14, the exo, will cut it out, and then it will be redone by the polymerase. So this corrects errors. And you can show that if you take away this gene from a coronavirus in cell culture, and you can grow the viruses without this, but after a number of passages, the, the viruses sustain uh, so many mutations that their infectivity drops dramatically. So that's the only known RNA correction enzyme as far as RNA polymerization goes. The DNA viruses, most polymerases can excise and replace misincorporated nucleotides, so they evolve much more slowly than RNA viruses. They have less diversity. So here's an example of DNA polymerization. We have a mismatch here. Uh, as the chain is growing, the three three to five prime exo will detect it, cut it out, and the polymerase will fix it. So error correction happens with DNA. It's not to, not to say that they don't make mistakes. You have to have mistakes. We'll see next time that 
Making mistakes is how you evolve, but they make far fewer. So I want to go through different inhibitors that act at different parts of the infectious cycle now and explain how they work, including we are going to talk about some attachment and uncoding inhibitors, some inhibitors of processing proteases, inhibitors of nucleic acid synthesis, polymerases, integrase inhibitors, assembly and release inhibitors, almost every step except uh, one. So the first entry inhibitor is that drug we mentioned earlier, amantadine. That's the molecule right there. Influenza viruses, remember, they have a channel in the virus particle. It's that little protein right there, sandwiched in between a couple of hemagglutinins. And during entry, when the virus is taken into the endosome, the endosome pH drops. The protons go through that channel into the virus particle interior, and so that when fusion happens, the RNP can come out and go in the nucleus. So you need low pH in the not only in the endosome to cause fusion, but in the virus particle to get uncoating. And this amantadine molecule interacts with the ion channel, which is made up of the M2 protein. It blocks the entry of protons into the virus particle. It blocks uncoating. So with amantadine, the viruses never get past this fusion step. And here's a model of the M2 ion channel. It's a tetramer. See, four chains that make a channel through the viral membrane. Protons just flow through. There's no active pumping. It's just a channel. And the drug blocks the channel by binding not, not only within the channel itself. The drug is shown in red here. Interacts with specific amino acids, but also on the outside of the channel, which presumably causes conformational changes, and that blocks protons from going through. You can readily get resistance by mutations that prevent the drug from binding. And as I said, almost every influenza A virus isolate is now resistant to this drug, so we don't use it anymore. Another entry inhibitor, Maraviroc, which is a CCR5 inhibitor. And so this one acts a little bit earlier. This is uh, an inhibitor of HIV-1, which remember envelope virus with with uh, glycoproteins in the envelope trimers. These glycoproteins bind two receptors. So here's a schematic of a monomer of the envelope composed of GP120 and GP41. GP120 binds CD4. That binding then exposes a high affinity binding site for CCR5, the second receptor. And then that finally triggers exposure of the fusion peptide, which is not shown here. But Maraviroc, small molecule shown in panel A, binds into CCR5. Here's a model of CCR5, and the, the transmembrane would be about right here. So Maraviroc is binding just above the transmembrane part. It blocks, here it is in a blue sphere. So it would block uh, the binding of GP120. So you it doesn't block virus attachment, but it blocks... Uh, GP120 binding to CCR5, so it blocks infectivity. So this is one of the many HIV-1 inhibitors that are used. Then we have a whole group of compounds that inhibit nucleic acid polymerases. And in fact, many antivirals are either nucleoside, nucleoside analog, which means there's no phosphates, on it, and, or nucleotide analogs, which means it could have, a nucleotide has between one and three phosphates. The existing nucleotide analogs have one phosphate, typically. And here in the middle are the four uh, DNA bases, of course, A, G, T, and C. And uh, these, are, these are nucleosides, actually. They compose of a base and a sugar. And from them have been chemically derived a whole variety of inhibitors. These are the molecules outside the yellow box. And you can see all the four bases are, can be chemically altered to make some kind of inhibitor. The one I want to tell you about first is acyclovir, a very effective anti-herpes virus drug. It is a nucleoside analog. You see it has no phosphates, and it's called a prodrug. It has to be activated, which means it actually has to be phosphorylated to be incorporated into the growing chain. And this is derived from guanosine. You can see the base is the same, but the sugar has been uh, modified and in particular, it doesn't have this hydroxyl. So this is a chain terminator, as you will see. The way this acts is you add it, you take it orally. It is absorbed into the blood and will enter cells. Here's acyclovir. It enters cells very nicely because it's not phosphorylated, no negative charge. In the cell, 
if the cell's infected with herpes simplex virus, it will be phosphorylated by the viral thymidine kinase enzyme. So if this drug gets into uninfected cells, nothing happens because there's no TK there. Very specific for virus-infected cells. And as a consequence, it's a great drug, very few side effects because it only works in virus-infected cells. So the herpes virus TK puts on one phosphate and then two different cell kinases put the second and the third phosphate on. You need three phosphates on, of course, to be an NTP, and it will then be incorporated into the viral DNA by, by the viral DNA polymerase. However, once it's put in, the chain ends because you can't add the next base. See, guanosine, from which this is derived, has a hydroxyl there. Uh, acyclovir does not. So the chain stops, DNA replication stops, the virus infectivity ends. All right, that's a chain terminator. There are going to be a lot of other compounds that are chain terminators. They all work in, in this way by terminating the chain and causing cessation of uh, nucleic acid synthesis. Uh, just as an example of how you can improve a drug. So acyclovir was discovered in the 60s. Uh, it wasn't great in terms of its oral bioavailability. It, you can put it on topically onto a cold sore, for example, and it would work well. But in some cases, you want to take a pill. It wasn't so bioavailable. So it turned out that they could make a modified form called valacyclovir, which is much better at going into the blood from eat, from taking it orally. We say it has improved bioavailability. And all they did was add a valine, the amino acid valine, onto a cyclovir to make valacyclovir. This is taken up really well. And then when it gets in the cell, the cell chops off the valine, so now you have a cyclovir. And so it's now the active drug. We do get a cyclovir resistance. These uh, mutants arise spontaneously during virus replication at low frequency, of course, because this is a DNA virus, but they do arise. And there are two different kinds of mutants. Some cannot phosphorylate the drug. These mutations to resistance are in the gene encoding the viral thymidine kinase. So we have a single amino acid change in the TK, which now makes the TK not able to phosphorylate the drug, so the drug doesn't work. The other resistant mutants are in the gene encoding the viral DNA polymerase. These Altered polymerases cannot incorporate the drug, the phosphorylated drug, into DNA, and so they're resistant as well. So two different resistance targets. And so that's important to note that by studying resistance, we learn you can have changes in the TK or changes in the polymerase, not just one. Another well-known terminator, chain terminator, is azetodeoxythymidine, or AZT, which was the first drug licensed for HIV-1. And this was, this was a drug that had been around. It was initially found during screens of anti-tumor compounds. And so it had been in people, and it, so it could be more rapidly approved for use uh, in, in uh, preventing or resolving HIV-1 infection. Uh, this is AZT here. It is a derivative of thymidine. And it, you, you, you must know that it had, having uh, three nitrogens here is, is not quite right, right? There should be a hydroxyl here. Uh, so that's AZT. It gets in the cell. It's phosphorylated by three different cellular kinases. There's no viral kinase involved here. And then it gets incorporated by the reverse transcriptase, and it terminates the chain because there's no hydroxyl there to add the next, next nucleotide. This is not a great substrate for cellular polymerases, so it's, it's a better substrate for HIV or RT, so that gives it some selectivity. But it's not great, nevertheless. It has a lot of side effects. Unlike acyclovir, right, because this one is phosphorylated by cell enzymes, so it can get into any cell and inhibit DNA synthesis. It has a very short half-life, so you have to be dosed two to three times a day. This short half-life combined with the multiple, multiple dosing led to the immediate uh, emergence of resistance shortly after uh, the drug was licensed for treatment of AIDS. So here's the thymidine, and that's the AZT derivative. There's a really good movie describing the early days of uh, AIDS therapy with AZT, the Dallas Buyers Club, where it was very hard to get this drug, and, and patients started sharing pills. They would split the pills and share them, and they found out that it worked, and that's how, in fact, the FDA found that they could lower the dose and use uh, have the supply go further. 
Of course, resistance to AZT arose almost immediately after the drug was licensed. It was really sad because people were very excited about it, and then within months there was resistance. Single amino acid changes at one of four sites in the reverse transcriptase. So here is RT. The active site is shown in yellow. AZT, of course, would bind in the active site to be incorporated, and amino acid changes in the active site cause resistance, so the AZT is not recognized. The altered RT do not bind a phosphorylated drug. So immediately other nucleoside analogs were developed, like didanosine, zalcitabine, stavudine, lemivudine, but uh, you know immediately we got resistance. So they started combining therapy using two antivirals together, but still mutations arose leading to resistance to two drugs in less than a year. We'll see the solution to this in a bit. There are also a class of compounds called non-nucleoside inhibitors. And in this case, we're looking at some non-nucleoside HIVRT inhibitors, NNRTIs. So here is the reverse transcriptase of HIV-1 with a DNA-RNA hybrid in it and the active site in yellow. And the binding site for these drugs is a bit away from the active site. And they changed the conformation of the active site to cause inhibition. So there's one called nivarapine, which binds here is in the red spheres, and then two others, delaverdine and efavirenz. Of course, we got resistance to all of these pretty quickly after their use uh, singly as well. Amino acid substitutions in any of seven residues that line the binding sites for these drugs, so we don't use these alone anymore. We have to use them in combination therapy. Our next question is... Resistance to what antiviral would involve amino acid changes in a viral enzyme? Resistance to acyclovir, amantadine, penicillin, or all of the above? How well, effective are the current antivirals against influenza? Well, they, are, they work if you take them within 24 to 48 hours after onset of infection. If you don't, they are useless. So they're only good if you take them very early, which is a problem. Or the side effects of Maraviroc, wouldn't blocking this receptor affect some cell function? Uh, actually, as you, you may remember, that 16% of the human population lack the CCR5 gene. So apparently we don't need it. So the drug has very few side effects as a consequence. Are polymerase inhibitors the closest option to broad-spectrum antivirals? Yes, they are, because polymerases are conserved. I'm going to talk about that later. And we could have had a polymerase inhibitor for all the corona RNA-dependent RNA polymerases ready, but nobody was working on it. How do we do here? Uh, the one uh, resistance to which antiviral would involve amino acid changes in a viral enzyme, most of you got acyclovir. The uh, enzyme would be TK or the DNA polymerase. Amantadine is the channel, so it's not an enzyme. And I'm glad no one picked penicillin. Thank you. It's, of course, an antimicrobial. All right, so we went through nucleic acids. We, we didn't talk about RNA polymerase, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inhibitors, but we'll talk about uh, one of them in a bit. Now let's talk about integrase. As you remember, the reverse transcriptase of retroviruses makes a DNA copy of the RNA genome. The integrase protein, a viral protein, then integrates that DNA, the retroviral DNA, into target DNA. So the integrase NICs, the target DNA, the DNA is ligated and filled in to integrate it. So these inhibitors, raltegravir and dotegravir, bind into the integrase and block this reaction. And these are very close-up views of this integrase reaction here, the, actually the ligation step, uh, which is happening here in step three. And so here is the active site of the integrase, and here is the three prime end uh, of the viral DNA. And these are two uh, manganese ions coordinated by this aspartate. These are important for the uh, integrase reaction. And the two drugs, RAL and DTG, are shown in separate views, RAL in pink and DTG in, in cyan. Well, technically, it's magenta in cyan. And they block the manganese from participating in the reaction so the ligation can't occur. And so this on the bottom here is a, a different view where we have the viral DNA in green and the host DNA in blue, and A and B are the manganese ions. The pink is the raltegravir blocking 
the ability of these enzymes to carry this enzyme to carry out the ligation because it's blocking the the manganese. So that's a very effective inhibitor of uh, infection. It's blocking integration, which is essential. Uh, here is a uh, RNA polymerase inhibitor for hepatitis C virus. Uh, this is called sofosbuvir. So this is a nucleotide analog. Uh, so this is taken orally. It's taken into cells. Uh, it is phosphorylated uh, once and then twice by cell enzymes. Uh, so you can see here that here's the base and the sugar, and it, it has this phosphate, which is buried chemically anyway. And so, so phosphates are hard to get into cells, but the, the chemist came up with this clever way of masking it, basically. And therefore, uh, this gets into cells uh, reasonably well. Uh, the, the burying group is taken off, as you can see. So now you have the first phosphate and then you just have to add two more phosphates on and you have an active triphosphate, which will inhibit the RNA polymerase. So it's a very clever formulation. Now, the company that first released this was charging $1,000 per pill. And a 12-week treatment would cost $84,000. There was a lot of controversy over this. And, and the company argued, well, you know, if you need a liver transplant, it's going to cost more. I don't want to talk too much about it, but for certain individuals who can't afford it, they will... Uh, work on the price. And for other countries that can't afford it, and there's a lot of hep C, they will work on the price as well. But there's a whole discussion about drug prices and so forth. Of course, the companies will say they have to pay for their research and development, but they have many other costs above that. And then we have another uh, inhibitor, relatively new, approved uh, in October 2018 for uh, treatment of influenza. Again, you need to give it to them no more than 48 hours after symptom onset. This is interesting. It's an inhibitor of the viral endonuclease. Baloxavir, there it is, picked up in a screening and, of course, modified extensively to get the right properties. So if you remember, when influenza virus mRNA synthesis occurs, the primer is a piece of mRNA from the cell, and in particular the cap and a few nucleotides, and this is cleaved off of the host cell mRNA by the endonuclease of the virus. So this on top here in gray is a, vi is a cellular mRNA. It's being cleaved by the viral endonuclease. And then the cleaved uh, primer serves as a primer for the synthesis of mRNA using the minus strand viral RNA as a template. The key here is that this endonuclease is inhibited by this drug, and that's how it works as an antiviral. So now we have multiple antivirals against influenza. So now there are inhibitors of proteases. We've gone further into the reproduction cycle of the virus. We know, for example, that the protease of the HIV-1 is absolutely essential for the production of infectious virus particle. It's labeled PR here. It's part of the polyprotein. It helps to cleave the, this polyprotein once it's in the virus particle. So the gag and the gag pole are made by different translational controls. So the gag, uh, just the short, the shorter version uh, containing the structural proteins, the gag pole includes the RT and the integrase. Uh, these are all brought into budding virus particles. We've talked about this process before. And then uh, once the virus particles are released, the protease cleaves these precursors to mature the virus particle. So if you take out the protease, you don't get infectious virus. So it's a valid target for inhibition, and many inhibitors of HIV protease have been made. Here's how some of the first were made. It shows how uh, drug modeling can work. So they start with a model of this, the substrate of the, of the protease, and this is the Paul precursor, and this is the cleavage site between a phi and a pro. And so they say, well, there's probably a transition state of this structure in the middle here. So let's model an inhibitor to look like the transition state. And so A74702 was a chemical first made to mimic this transition state. And it was a little bit active, but not good enough. It had to be further modified. And eventually the drug that was made, ritonavir, looks like this. So you can see it contains the core of that initial inhibitor, but a lot of other modifications to improve its solubility, bioavailability, and so forth, potency. And this is a licensed inhibitor of HIV protease. Uh, 
And here on the right is the structure of the HIV protease. It is a dimer, cyan and magenta colors. The active site is in yellow. And here in red is ritonavir bound in the active site. So this mimics, this is what we call a peptidomimetic. It mimics the protease substrate. Looks like the two amino acids on either side of the cleavage site. Fits in the active site and blocks the protease from working. We've also made inhibitors of hepatitis C virus protease. The hep C genome is plus stranded. It is translated to form a single polyprotein. The polyprotein has to be cleaved to form structural and non-structural proteins, and there are two viral proteases involved. NS3 is the one that carries out most of the cleavages shown by these orange arrows. And here is NS3 structure at the lower right in green, active site in yellow. And again, chemicals were screened to inhibit, and one of the candidates that eventually was licensed is telaprevir. It's a red molecule here, fits in the active sites and blocks the protease of HCV and is a very effective antiviral drug. So that is maturation of the virus proteins, if you will. And now let's look at inhibitors of release. And uh, the, the release inhibitors are characterized by the influenza virus neuraminidase inhibitors. These are drugs that inhibit the glycoprotein on the surface of the part particle, that's the neuraminidase. Remember, here's a influenza particle. You have HAs, which bind receptors, and then there's neuraminidase, which are these uh, orange molecules, also glycoproteins in the mature particle. Where are the neuraminidase functions? As virus particles bud from the cell, the cell has sialic acid receptors shown by this red Y on the surface. And HA will just bind the sialic acid, if it weren't for the neuraminidase, which is an enzyme that cleaves this sialic acid from the cell surface to allow release of the particles. If you inhibit the neuraminidase, you get what's shown in the bottom picture, an electron micrograph of influenza viruses budding from a cell. You can see they're all in chains because they're stuck to one another. They have sialic acid in them because the neuraminidase is inactive. So you need neuraminidase to remove sialic acid from the virus particle from the cell surface so the newly budded particles can move away and infect other cells. So these inhibitors, Relenza and Tamiflu, so the trade names for Zanamivir and Oseltamivir, these were designed to mimic the ligand of neuraminidase, sialic acid. So the structure of the neuraminidase was determined. We're looking top down here, and you can see the sialic acid binding pocket. Sialic acid is in green. And they said, let's model this sialic acid and see what kind of drug we can make that would look like it. And these two came out of the of that synthesis, essentially. They are two sialic acid-like compounds that fit in this pocket, prevent sialic acid from going in. They inhibit neuraminidase, and so the virus particles never leave the cell surface. So they are inhibitors of virus release from the cell surface. And these are two drugs you can get today if you have flu, and you can go to a doctor and get a prescription from them uh, for them. One is taken orally and one is inhaled. So again, these are designed to mimic the natural ligand sialic acid. And the logic was, if we make these drugs as close as we can to sialic acid, it's less likely that the neuraminidase can change to avoid drug binding because if it does, it won't be able to function. It won't be able to function to remove sialic acid, and so the virus will be dead. So let's make it as close as possible. Well, it turns out that one is closer than the other is to sialic acid. And so here's a cartoon showing that. We have sialic acid on the host cell, neuraminidase on the virus particle, and the purple Y. All right? Sialic acid is like the arrowhead. Zanamivir looks like the arrowhead. It's really close mimic of sialic acid. Very hard to get resistance to zanamivir. On the other hand, oseltamivir, Tamiflu, this is the one you take orally. Uh, this looks different, even though it binds in the pocket. looks different from sialic acid. So you can get single amino acid changes blocking Tamiflu binding, but will still allow the neuraminidase to bind sialic acid. Tamiflu is different enough from sialic acid that you can get this resistance. Very hard to get resistance to uh, zanamivir, relenza. Now, the CDC monitors resistance to these drugs, to these antivirals every year. 
So you can go to this website, and this is a summary of testing on samples collected since September of last year. And they, they collect thousands of influenza viruses from patients. And you can see the total viruses tested, broken down into H1, H3, and the B viruses, and then tested for resistance to Tamiflu, Paramavir, another uh, neuraminidase inhibitor, uh, Zanamivir, the other neuraminidase inhibitor, and then Biloxivir, the endonuclease inhibitor. So let's see what we have here in terms of reduced inhibition, highly reduced inhibition. Like we have one uh, Tamiflu resistant, four highly resistant total, all, all uh, A, H1N1. So you can see none reduced inhibition, but a, a number highly uh, resistant to paramavir, okay? So highly reduced inhibition means highly resistant. And 5.2%, it's not huge, but these could spread and cause a problem. And then zanamivir, no uh, highly resistant viruses. So that's the one that's harder to get resistance to, and the few two that are somewhat resistant. And no, no resistance to uh, biloxivir yet, so that's good. Now, the bad news is, I told you before, all these viruses are resistant to amantadine, so we, we don't even use those anymore. So this is your choice for antivirals against influenza virus. Okay, our next question is, which of the following targets for HIV antivirals inhibits the earliest stage of infection? A, nucleoside inhibitors, B, NNRTIs, CCR5 inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, fusion inhibitors. All right, how'd we do? First, you got CCR5, which is right. That's inhibitor of binding. So binding is before fusion. So that's why that E is not right. All right, let's ask the question, can we make broad-spectrum antivirals? And here's one that was developed a number of years ago. It's not a drug. It's not been approved. It's a candidate. It's called LJ001. And this is a table that lists a whole lot of different viruses and whether they have an envelope and whether they're inhibited by LJ001. So the plus means LJ001 has antiviral activity. And you can see it inhibits uh, RNA viruses of different polarities, and it inhibits DNA viruses, but only viruses that have an envelope. So the three non-envelope viruses here, adenococci B and real viruses, they're not enveloped, they're not inhibited. So this is an antiviral that targets the viral envelope, the viral membrane. Here's the molecule, LJ001, and what it does is it breaks up the, the envelope of the virus. And so these are experiments done with vesicular stomatitis virus, a bullet-shaped particle. Here's, the, here's what the particle looks like in DMSO, the, the diluent, the solvent that the drug is dissolved in. Uh, here is a, a related compound, LJ25, that's not active, and the particles remain intact. And here's LJ001. It just trashes the particles. It binds to the membrane and, and breaks it. You may ask, well, doesn't it have toxicity? It doesn't. This will bind to cell membranes, but cell membranes regenerate very quickly. And so the cells don't get harmed, but virus particles, are you get all the membrane you're going to get when you're made. And so if it's trashed by the drug, that's the end of the particle. So this was a promising antiviral. It never went anywhere. Uh, not clear to me what the issue was, no longer under development, but it's a prototype for how a broad spectrum could act by hitting a lot of envelope viruses. And there's certainly a lot of envelope viruses out there, including SARS-CoV-2. But there are some others, broadly inhibitory antivirals that target the polymerases. And here's one, favipiravir. It's also known as Avigan. You may have heard of this because it's being tested against SARS-CoV-2. This is a broad spectrum inhibitor of RNA viruses, and it's a nucleoside analog. Here is favipiravir. This gets into cells readily. It is phosphorylated by cellular kinases to make the triphosphate. This, this will get into RNA polymerase active site. It will be incorporated and cause chain termination. The favipiravir doesn't have a, a ribose, but that's added by HGPRT, the cellular enzyme. And then uh, even though it has hydroxyls. Because of the fluorine, it messes up the incorporation of the subsequent triphosphate. So you don't have to lack a, 
a hydroxyl to act as a chain terminator. It's this fluorine is what does it. So this inhibits a whole bunch of plus strand RNA viruses. Some of these you may recognize. Negative strand RNA viruses, including some very bad ones. Uh, it's licensed in Japan to treat influenza. It hasn't been licensed here, but is being tested uh, in a number of clinical trials against SARS-CoV-2. I would predict it's going to inhibit it, and uh, we'll see if it's effective and can be used. But this, since it's licensed at least in one country, could presumably be brought more rapidly to use for the current pandemic. So that's a broadly uh, inhibiting RNA virus drug. This is an example of a broad spectrum inhibitor of DNA viruses, all these DNA viruses here. Adenovirus, poxvirus, herpes simplex, polyoma, papilloma, sidofovir, uh, which is a nucleotide analog. You can see it has a phosphate in it. It is what's called an acyclic cytosine phosphonate, another clever chemical way of getting uh, a phosphate into cells. Uh, the phosphate makes it a mimic of deoxy-CMP. It's not quite a CMP, but it's a mimic of it. This gets into cells. This doesn't get into cells highly effectively because of the phosphate, but it gets in. It's diphosphorylated by host cell enzyme. So you, this host cell is put one, two phosphate. So now you have a three phosphate substrate, and this has a high affinity for DNA polymerases, higher than for the host, which is turns out to be a property of these acyclic nucleotide analogs. And so uh, this will inhibit the DNA polymerase and works well against these viruses. So there is hope for making broad spectrum as long as you choose the target that is present in a lot of viruses. And I think DNA and RNA polymerases are great targets. Now, of course, in all cases, you're going to get resistance to these drugs. So you'll need to use more than one. So if you develop one, it's fine initially, but you need to have more than one to combat resistance. So that brings us to SARS-CoV-2 on antivirals that are under evaluation. I found 79 trials uh, for these drugs, antiviral approaches. You can find them at clinicaltrials.gov. Just search for COVID-19. And this is a figure I took from uh, Viral Zone, which is a great virus site, which summarizes some of these. So let's go through some of the neutralizing antibodies, of course, we've talked about before. Tasiluzumab is, uh, is a monoclonal against the IL-6 receptor, and that's to combat the uh, dysregulated host immune response, the cytokine storm, which is part of the disease. Uh, then we have this inhibitor, chemistat mesylate, which inhibits TMPRSS2, which is the host cell protease uh, that cleaves the spike glycoprotein, and it's essential for infectivity, and, and this inhibits the virus in cell culture, so this can be tested in people. Uh, chloroquine is under investigation. It raises the endosomal pH to block fusion. And then we have uh, both nucleotide and nucleoside analogs. Remdesivir is a nucleotide analog uh, that is being tested to inhibit the RNA polymerase chain terminator. And favipiravir, which we just talked about, the nucleoside analog that's being tested as well. Uh, and then, you know, this virus, the coronavirus genome encodes proteases. These are three HIV protease inhibitors lopinavir, ritonavir, and darunavir, which are all being tested for activity against coronavirus. FDA-approved drugs, very easy to be able to test them uh, against another virus and see if they work at all. A lot of activity, obviously, against SARS-CoV-2. I want to end up with two interesting stories of antiviral success, and that is combination therapy for AIDS and for hepatitis C. And on the left is the reproduction cycle of HIV-1, and all the inhibitors we have that block attachment and entry, fusion, reverse transcription, integration, and protease that we can use, and hepatitis C virus on the right, and we have a number of inhibitors. We've talked about MIR-122 agents in a previous talk. I told you today about uh, polymerase inhibitors and protease inhibitors. So for both, because these viruses cause lifelong persistent infections, and there are millions and millions of cases globally. There was incentive to develop a host of drugs against both viruses. And the key to resolving these infections, to the extent that we can, you'll see, is combination therapy. And for retroviruses, this was first discovered. It's called highly active antiretroviral therapy, where you can now convert 
a virus that kills you into one that causes a chronic lifetime disease. Typically, we mix three different drugs that target different mechanisms. And remember, for HIV, this does not cure the infection. We always have a latent reservoir of infected cells with proviruses in them. What this does is keep virus levels down so that you have a higher level of CD4 cells and you can survive. So this does not cure infection in contrast to hep C, which we'll see does. So here are the mathematics of drug resistance. If you need one mutation for drug resistance, the RT makes one mistake every 10,000 bases polymerized. So every base is substituted and every 10,000 viruses made. An infected person makes 10 to the 10th new viruses per day. That means you're making a million viruses every day with resistance to a single drug. That's why it's such a problem. What about two drugs? Developing resistance to true drugs is 10 to the 4th times 10 to the 4th. You need 10 to the 8th mutants. 100 viruses are made every day in an infected person resistant to two drugs. A little better, but this is why we still get resistance to two drugs. But if you have three drugs, you need 10 to the 12th viruses, and that's more than you're making a day. And now a caveat to all these calculations, of course, is that replication su is suppressed by drugs. And so you're not going to have 100 viruses per day, maybe fewer, and it will take longer to get resistance. But triple therapy is the key. It was shown in clinical trials to work. And now this is what we do. And this is a table showing all the antivirals developed against uh, HIV-1 over the years, starting with AZT, the RT inhibitor, a whole host of nucleoside and nucleotide inhibitors, non-nucleoside inhibitors, protease inhibitors, integrase and entry inhibitors. We talked about most of these, how they work. And then we have our combinations. You can see here, tr double and triple combinations with different names made by a variety of companies. And these are used to treat patients. They work to suppress infection and they convert a lethal infection to a, a chronic infection. Antiretroviral therapy saves lives. This is, the act, this is the actual numbers of people receiving ART, not projected. Uh, the actual numbers in the different WHO region, you can see we're targeting more and more people who need these drugs. Many millions of people are getting them. And these are the number of adult deaths averted over the years by antiretroviral uh, therapy. So the, the purple line, the deaths averted, and the actual deaths in green. Uh, and these are infections that we've prevented in red by treating mothers. This is pregnant mother-to-child transmission by giving the pregnant mother drug before birth, suppressing virus and pre preventing infection. So these are the new infections transmitted by birth, children acquiring HIV infection. And in red, the increasing numbers we can prevent by treating mothers uh, with these drugs. We also do now in addition to post-exposure prophylaxis, where you are diagnosed with HIV infection, you're given a drug, you now can have pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, daily double therapy, tenofovir and emtricitabine. That's this one right here. For those at risk, you can take this if you believe you're at risk. Reduces the risk of sexual transmission by over 90%. It reduces the risk of transmissions by IV drug use by about 70%. So it's the one case where we give drugs to people who are not infected, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Hepatitis C drug regimens have been amazing. We have developed double and triple therapies now. And this is a graph showing the development of various treatment regimens. Before 2013, we treated patients with interferon and ribavirin, which was an extremely ineffective and sometimes toxic combination because, as you know, interferon causes flu-like symptoms. And if you take it all the time, which is what these patients had to do, they felt horrible. And the weeks needed to treat these infections were huge, over a year in some cases. Now remember, HCV doesn't have a latent reservoir. So in theory, it is curable. You can get rid of all the virus in a person, and that person will be free of disease, unlike HIV, where there's a provirus. We started to make these direct-acting antivirals the inhibitors of proteases and RNA polymerases, and that reduced the length of treatment to where now, after 2016, 
The length of the shortest treatment, it's less than 15 weeks in some cases, and sometimes 12. So we can cure a person of hep C with double or triple therapy in a couple of months. It's really remarkable. So this is now an eradicable disease uh, using this, these drug combinations. However, remember that no matter uh, how many drugs we have, there's always resistance. Right now, there are 10 to the 16th HIV genomes on the planet knowing all the number of people who are infected. And with that number of genomes, there are ones that exist that are resistant to every one of those drugs that we have now or we ever will have. So drug development continues and new approaches to removing uh, latently infected cells are also essential. So next time we'll move into the part of this course that looks at how new viruses emerge. We're gonna talk about evolution. Evolution.